Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Braden Banglin, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu or by speaking with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are unable and ask if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you are part of our virtual audience, you also may submit your questions at dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now, please join me in welcoming Senior Associate Director, Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Braden, very much. I'll say good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics for tonight's 18th Constitution Day program. Titled this tonight is Recent Constitutional Law and the Impact on Kansas Politics. The Dole Institute's uh, Constitution Day program is made possible by the support of a longtime friend of the Dole Institute, Mark P. Johnson. Thank you, all of you, for joining us this evening. On your way out tonight, please take a moment to visit the Kansas Veterans uh, Virtual Memory Wall. The Kansas Veterans Virtual Wall expands our original archive to include over 5,000 digital images and stories of Kansas veterans from World War II to the present. Please consider submitting or updating your Kansas veterans photo and brief memory, story or other details about their terms of office. It is an honor to share their stories. On the back of your program are upcoming programs. I hope you will look at them and join us for our programs. And one I'll just highlight will be the Elizabeth Dole Women in Leadership Lecture. And Sherry Rollins Weston, President of Sesame Workshop, will be here Wednesday, October the 5th, and the program will be 7 p.m. In honor of Constitution Day, on Saturday, September the 24th, we celebrated Constitution Day at Memorial Stadium uh, at the KU versus Duke football game with Chancellor Douglas Gerard leading football fans in the preamble to the Constitution. Elizabeth Bergout, who's our Caroliner, rang the bells from the Campanile, and following the preamble, the Marching Jayhawks played the national anthem. That wasn't just for that particular game because we were 3-0. and oh. It was something we have done for 17 years. It just happened. It was the biggest event uh, with a huge crowd, and I think people were very excited. They're still excited, and they're looking for 5-0. and oh. So, but before I introduce our guest tonight, I will ask you in joining me in commemorating Constitution Day by ringing your bells if you took them and reciting the preamble as printed in your program. We will start. Bells can ring. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Thank you. Tonight's distinguished panel will be moderated by Lou Mulligan, the Earl B. Hertz Research Professor of Law at the University of Kansas. Lou 
joined the KU faculty in 2010, where he teaches predominantly civil litigation courses. In the ensuing years, KU law students have recognized Lou for his teaching several times, including awarding him the Dean Frederick J. Moreau uh, uh, Teaching and Mentoring Award. Lou has authored and co-authored four books and treatises on jurisdiction and procedure. In addition to his duties at KU Law, Lou served or continues to serve on the Kansas Judicial Council, Civil Rules Advisory Committee, the U.S. 10th Cir uh, Circuit Court of Appeal, Criminal Justice Act Panel, and the Kansas Court of Appeals Mediation Study Committee. I will start with our guest, and we are extremely honored this evening to have all three of them. I will start with Cannon Shambigan. He's a partner at the law firm of Paul, Weiss, Rifle, Wharton, and Garrison. He is the chair of the firm's Supreme Court and Appellate Litigation Practice and managing partner of the Washington office. He has argued 34 cases before the Supreme Court and over 100 appeals in courts across the country. Paul Davis is a graduate of the University of Kansas and the Washburn University School of Law. He practices law with the Paul Davis Law Firm here in Lawrence and with the Topeka Law Firm of Frieden and Forbes. He is a lifelong resident of Lawrence and served in the Kansas House of Representatives from 2003 to 2015. He served as the House Minority Leader from 2009 to 2015 where he developed a reputation for building bipartisan coalitions on numerous issues. Ryan Kriegshauser is a partner at the Kriegshauser Nye Law Group. He has been involved in numerous Kansas election law, campaign finance, and high profile constitutional cases. Previously, Kriegshauser served as general counsel at the office of the Kansas Securities Commissioner and prior served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Office of Legal Counsel and Policy in Kansas. He currently serves in the Navy Reserves as a Lieutenant Commander. Also in your program, you have a full uh, biology, uh, biography, I should tell you, of all the other things that each of these individuals has done. If you are joining us on our YouTube channel, Please email your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. I would also like to say we have two Lawrence graduates here this evening. They're both natives of Lawrence, Kansas, and we are extremely proud to recognize both of them from Lawrence High graduates and for their accomplishments. That is not to say that Ryan Kriegshauser is not outstanding. <laughs> He just didn't graduate from Lawrence High School, and he is not a native of Lawrence. But I want you to please welcome very warmly all of our guests this evening and Lou Mullen. Thank you very much. Lou, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Well, it's nice to see folks here. It's uh, nice to greet folks uh, online. I assume I can now convince my daughters I'm a YouTube star. Uh, this is my big uh, opportunity for that. Uh, great to see some of my students here. We will still have class at 8 in the morning, and you will all be called on. Um, this is a, 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 a unique treat to uh, have such a, uh, an incredible panel uh, here to visit with us. Um, and so uh, we're just going to warm up uh, with the uh, abortion debate. Um, <laughs> so uh, unless you've lived under a rock, uh, you are aware that the United States Supreme Court uh, held in the Dobbs decision this June that states can regulate uh, abortion care services. Uh, overturning uh, decades of precedents that was limiting that to, to some degree. Uh, in that case, what we had was a Mississippi <coughs> statute which um, barred m most uh, abortions after 15 weeks, um, and that case moved its way up the, the court system, and the Supreme Court took the case. So I'm going to start with Cannon. Uh, before we get to that moment that ends in June, can you give us a little bit of the constitutional history 
um, you know, from row four and what was going on there? Sure, so I'm happy to do that, Lou, but let me just first say what a complete privilege it is to be here um, at the Dole Institute and at KU. This is very special for me for any number of reasons. Um, KU runs in the family, my late father and now my brother teach here at KU. As uh, Barbara said, I, of course, grew up in Lawrence. It's great to see Paul Stewie here, who was my American history teacher and who is a large part of the reason why uh, I became a lawyer and devoted my career to uh, the service of the law, so it's great to see you, Mr. Stewie, and um, very special to be back here in my hometown, and in particular to be here at the Dole Institute because I revered Bob Dole. I worked for him as an intern in the summer of 1991. Hopefully all of the students in the audience will immediately think, boy, he's older than he looks, <laughs> but uh, it really was that long ago that I worked for the great um, senator who was not only um, a, a great Kansan, one of the greatest Kansans, but also such a role model for um, civility and discourse. Which brings us to the most contentious public <laughs> issue of the day, the issue of abortion. So um, the arc of the history of abortion and abortion before the Supreme Court is actually pretty straightforward. Um, when I was an infant in 1973, the Supreme Court decided Roe versus Wade, um, which um, recognized a constitutional right to an abortion, and therefore essentially took the issue of abortion out of the public debate. And it did so on controversial legal grounds. The Supreme Court relied on a doctrine that has come to be known as substantive due process. The notion is that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution not only guarantees procedural rights, the right to process before uh, an individual is deprived of um, a liberty or property, but also certain substantive rights. That was a doctrine that originated really in a case called um, Griswold versus Connecticut, which recognized a right to contraception. The court extended that right to abortion in Roe versus Wade. Uh, we have had essentially 50 years of um, unending controversy since that decision, because again, the Supreme Court's decision created this constitutional right. It removed the issue from um, the political branches. Uh, and the Supreme Court, over the course of 50 years, retained that right, but importantly, modified the way in which the right operated. In a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, in the early 1990s, the Supreme Court held that a state could regulate abortion as long as it does not place an undue burden on a woman's right to an abortion. And so that was the legal standard that governed for a period of 30 years. Because abortion is such a contentious issue, I think the issue of where um, judicial nominees stood on the question of abortion really became front and center in the nomination debates for the Supreme Court. And over the course of time, we saw the nomination process become more and more contentious. We saw really both parties make vows to nominate justices who would take um, positions either supporting Roe versus Wade or um, supporting the end of Roe versus Wade. Um, that was a centerpiece um, of uh, President Trump's campaign for president in uh, 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 2016, and he vowed to nominate um, justices who would vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. Well, that brings us to the case that Lou mentioned, uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. As he said, it meant involved a Mississippi law that prohibited abortion um, after 15 weeks. The Supreme Court granted review in that case. In the meantime, Justice Ginsburg passed away in 2020. She was replaced by uh, uh, Justice Barrett, who was nominated by President Trump toward the end of his term uh, and, and confirmed uh, shortly before the 2020 uh, election. And at that point, the state of Mississippi um, made the strategic decision that it was really gonna go for broke, and it was gonna argue that the Supreme Court should overturn Roe versus Wade and also Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And um, I think that that judgment was undoubtedly informed by the change in the court's membership and some uh, 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 confidence that this was something that the Supreme Court would at least consider. But one of the interesting things that took place as the case was being litigated was that there was really no effort by either side to propose a middle ground to the Supreme Court. And I think that, that was in part because it was difficult to see exactly what that middle ground would look like. 
And certainly coming out of the oral argument, it appeared that there would be a majority of the court that was willing to overturn Roe versus Wade. And then in May of this year, we had the extraordinary development that a draft majority opinion uh, from the Supreme Court leaked to the press. It leaked to Politico, which published the draft opinion online. That was, for those of us who follow the court, a real oh my goodness moment because nothing like that had happened in the modern era. The court soon after confirmed that the draft opinion was a valid one. And that draft opinion uh, uh, purported to overrule Roe versus Wade. And so in some sense, I think everyone had a sense that this might be coming. But it nevertheless um, was uh, just a seismic event when at the end of June, the court released its opinion. In the end, five justices um, voted to overturn Roe versus Wade. They took the position both that it was incorrectly decided and that the so-called doctrine of stare decisis, that's the notion that the court should not lightly overrule its past decisions, did not justify retaining it. Um, the court's three Democratic appointees, um, Justices uh, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Breyer, who of course has since retired, wrote a joint dissenting opinion, really calling the court to task for uh, uh, overruling Roe and, and really casting doubt on the legitimacy of that decision. And in the end, there was only one justice, um, Chief Justice Roberts, who tried to stake out a middle position. He would have upheld the Mississippi law um, on the ground that it afforded women a reasonable opportunity to obtain an abortion before the 15-week limit was hit. And the Chief Justice um, chided his colleagues on both sides for what he described as their, quote, relentless freedom from doubt, end quote, on the issue of abortion. But in the end, there were not a lot of fellow travelers in that middle ground. The Chief Justice wrote only for himself, and so uh, the court overruled Roe versus Wade, and thus returned the issue of abortion to uh, the political branches, which I, I know will be the subject of much further discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. So, so uh, speaking uh, of politics, I want to start with you, Ryan, and then we'll mm -hmm. go to Paul. But uh, Summarizing 50 years of, of Kansas politics uh, around this, this issue is not what I'm going to ask you, but uh, can you remind us, how has that, how has um, the uh, abortion question animated Kansas politics over the last decade or, or more, leading up to 2019's a big event in Kansas with the HOTUSes, mm -hmm. but le leading up to that, how has that been impactful for us? Well, I think <clears throat> the, the pro-life movement had had about two decades worth of successes uh, in the legislature, but there was always a backstop, and that was Roe and Casey. There was only so far that they could go. And I think some national groups uh, viewed the possibility that maybe Roe and Casey wouldn't be there, and so they uh, strategically sought out litigation in states uh, to urge state Supreme Courts to find constitutional rights in their state constitution, and that happened in 2019, as you yeah. uh, mentioned, in the Hodes decision, the Kansas Supreme Court uh, found a right to abortion in the Kansas Constitution um, based in this uh, right to bodily autonomy. And they went actually further than Casey and further than Roe and said any regulation or restriction on abortion had to pass strict scrutiny. And so um, I think that was a step beyond uh, Roe and Casey. Yeah. But that really did, um, now it's a constitutional right yeah. in the state of Kansas. So again, takes it out of the political uh, arena to some extent. Yeah. And so uh, for those, strict scrutiny is not just a very popular legal podcast, uh, <laughs> but it, it is uh, also a way in which courts, uh, in some sense, value government's action when it impacts a right. So meaning the government has the highest burden to show that if it's going to interact with your right, it has to, su to succeed so-called strict scrutiny. So the government has to have a really important uh, interest, right? And it has to show we're only impacting this right in the smallest way, as opposed to most legislation, which would have to pass so-called rational basis review, which is there was a sentient being in the government and they thought of a reason and therefore it's okay. So to say that it's strict scrutiny means that, it, it, boy, they're pro really protecting that right. So we, we, we see this has been animating stuff. So Paul, with your experience in the legislature, you know, when you were, uh, uh, the many years you were there, how was the abortion issue impacting legislation and what the legislators were, legislators were thinking about and how they were navigating through that space here in Kansas? Yeah. You know, 
I think that at the time that I was there, there was, um, there was an abortion-related bill uh, just about every year. And it was, um, you know, in different manners, trying to kind of uh, work uh, around uh, or, or, or bump up to the, the line that, that Casey and, and Roe had set, um, you know, as, as far as, uh, as you could. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a tremendously uh, controversial issue. I, I always remember uh, those days when those debates would occur, and it was, it was, a, it was a different day. Um, because uh, uh, what I could see, um, you know, for, for those on um, the, you know, the pro-life side is just um, how important that issue was to them. And um, you had to, uh, I, when I was leader for six years, I would always remind my caucus that, uh, that the, the discussion needs to, to be as civil as possible and you need to respect uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the people who are largely on the other side of this issue feel very, very strongly about it. And, uh, and so, you know, we had uh, a, a lot of contentious uh, debates um, and, you know, largely those, a lot of those, those bills passed. However, um, you know, during the eight years um, when Kathleen Sebelius and Mark Parkinson were in the governor's office, those bills were largely vetoed and uh, a lot of those vetoes were upheld um, uh, by the, the smallest of, uh, of margins. Um, now um, they're, uh, and you've, you know, two thirds uh, vote to overturn a veto and um, you know, now in both chambers there are, there are clearly two thirds votes to, to overturn a, a gubernatorial veto on an abortion issue. So ter thank you, Paul. So ter turning a little bit, Cannon, back to you, back to the law again, and you can object as a compound question because I have, I have two, two parts uh, for you. Uh, so first, could you uh, tell us what does it mean when, you know, in the press, the overturned row, we, you know, what, what exactly does that mean, right? It's un not sure all of our audience will know for sure um, who that empowers and who it doesn't empower. And then if you could also talk to us a, a little bit about, a little more about this idea of substantive process and what does that mean per se versus freedom of speech in the First Amendment and that and compare, compare those Sure, words. so I'm happy to address um, both of those issues. So, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, maybe actually to sort of um, uh, uh, address those issues in, in reverse order, I'll sure. start with the issue of substantive due process. So, uh, uh, essentially, substantive due process is the notion that by guaranteeing due process, the Constitution thereby protects certain substantive rights. And over the years, um, the Supreme Court has recognized certain rights under substantive due process and not others. And so, for instance, the court recognized, as I mentioned, the right to contraception. It recognized a right to abortion. It recognized more recently a right to same-sex marriage in the Obergefell versus Hodges case. It has not recognized, for instance, a right to assisted suicide, and it has suggested that um, one looks to history and tradition in, in defining the scope of those rights. But so, you know, there's been a live question in the law for many years about whether or not substantive due process is really uh, a thing at all. And what was interesting about what the Supreme Court did in the Dobbs case was that it said, we don't think that there is a right to abortion as part of substantive due process, but we're really not gonna consider the fundamental question of whether or not substantive due process exists at all, or whether instead the due process clause guarantees only procedural rights. And indeed, the majority went out of its way to indicate that it did not intend to revisit, for instance, Obergefell, the case guaranteeing a right to same-sex marriage. Alone among the justices, Justice Thomas wrote separately to say that as a principled matter, he would junk the entire doctrine. And ironically enough, that caused the majority to be criticized by the dissent for acting in an unprincipled way by focusing only on the issue of abortion. And I think that probably rec reflected some practical disquiet on the part of the majority with going further and upending uh, expectations in other areas of the law. 
Now, what does it mean to overrule a, a right that the Supreme Court has recognized? Well, essentially what that means is simply that the Constitution does not provide any affirmative right in and of itself that therefore cannot be disturbed by a legislature, because after all, if the Constitution guarantees a right like the right to free speech, a legislature cannot come in and say, you no longer have the right to go to um, South Park and speak if you want to. And so the effect is to return the issue to the political process. But that in and of itself um, is a sort of complicated issue because there are a lot of ways in which the political process can act. One way in which the political process can act is uh, through the legislature. And ordinarily one might think that an issue would go back to the state legislature. A state legislature could pass a law one way or another. The governor would have to sign or veto that bill. That's how legislation ordinarily works. But a complication that we've been talking about even on the state level is the existence of state constitutions because the same principles operate on the state level as operate on the federal level. A state constitution can provide every bit as much protection and more for a right than the federal constitution does. State Supreme Courts have the same power that the US Supreme Court does when it comes to interpreting constitutions. So the Kansas Supreme Court can interpret the Kansas Constitution in much the same way that the US Supreme Court interprets the US Constitution. And just to make things a little more complicated, the other question is whether the federal government can regulate. And there's a complicated body of law that governs the circumstances in which states can regulate, the circumstances in which Congress and the federal government can regulate. Congress has to act pursuant to a power that the Constitution gives it, such as the power to regulate interstate commerce. And when a state acts one way and the federal government acts another, there is a complex body of law that determines when federal law rules and when state law rules. It seems unlikely that the federal government will regulate on the issue of abortion for the simple reason that, as everyone knows, we have gridlock between the two major political parties. And as a practical matter, it requires a majority of 60 senators uh, to uh, pass a law on any issue. And while there's been talk about eliminating that rule, as long as the Senate is fairly equally divided, it seems unlikely that Congress will try to act. And that's why, as a practical matter, this really is a question for the states. And in a state like Kansas, where you already have a state Supreme Court decision interpreting the state constitution, you then have the question of whether or not to modify that rule. Yeah. So, Ryan, so we perfect setup. It's almost if we planned this <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, of moving to the state constitution, and you you foreshadowed this Kansas constitutional case called Hodes that came down in 2019. So, not planned in any way, but it. S acting separately, the state of Kansas had, had passed uh, a, a, a statute regulating uh, abortion services, and it ends up in the Kansas Supreme Court, and it was, and you, as you suggested, was decided in a, with a different foundation. And could you explain that different foundation for as, us? As in for Hodes? Yeah. yeah. So the Supreme Court uh, looked at this right to bodily autonomy that it found in the Kansas Constitution, um, and really had a very complicated, long, somewhat meandering walk through history on how this, you know, 1800s constitution foresaw abortion, first of all, and then uh, found a right to it. And so uh, a lot of the, the substance of the, of the opinion is kind of walking through history on, on why this, this right exists. Uh, but then because they found it to be a fundamental right, then as you mentioned, uh, they said that strict scrutiny had to apply, which means uh, any law that was regulating abortion had to be narrowly tailored to meet a compelling state interest. Uh, and subsequent, uh, they, they struck down, I think that was a partial birth abortion mm -hmm. bill uh, at the time, and subsequent to that, uh, clinic licensure was struck down. Um, and I think uh, telemedicine is currently being litigated right now. But then there are a number of other abortion laws that are on the books in Kansas, but most legal scholars believe that they couldn't survive strict scrutiny uh, given the, the height of that, that standard. Right, and, and the Kansas constitutional, so as Cannon was telling us, the, the federal constitution is in the, a provision is in this thing called due process, which is that no state shall uh, um, take, away or prevent your, take away your life, liberty, or property without due process of law to deprive you of that. And the Kansas decision is based in a mildly changed version of the Declaration of Independence language, which is unique to the Kansas Constitution. The federal Constitution does not have the Declaration of Independence in it. And the 
Declaration of Independence actually doesn't have the status of federal law. Uh, it's more like a moral argument. Whereas in Kansas, in Kansas law, our, our first Bill of Rights is a statement of the Declaration of Independence. So there's a different textual basis with a different history, and that's the, the history they went through um, with that being debated during the height of the Civil War and the idea of what would that mean and what does bodily autonomy mean. And that's, uh, that's, so it's different arguments getting to the same place, which highlights Cannon's point that you can have two different governments with different legal texts and different foundations, you know, getting us to that. So we had the HOTUS decision, uh, and, and very little happened politically after that, did it, Paul, here in Kansas? <laughs> uh, uh, um, so what, what happened in the, what was the legislature's response to, to, to HOTUS? Yeah, so uh, the legislature's response was what all of you voted on here uh, in, the, in the last election in August, and uh, that was the, the constitutional amendment uh, that would uh, uh, create a provision whereby the legislature would be, uh, had the authority and the power to, to regulate and limit and restrict uh, abortion. Uh, for, for those of you who, who don't know a little bit about the constitutional uh, process in Kansas, uh, the legislature, uh, you know, periodically you will vote on constitutional amendments. Uh, you're going to have uh, uh, one, I think maybe two on the ballot here in November. Um, they don't get a lot of, of, of publicity. Uh, we had one on uh, establishing a constitutional right to hunt, um, as, if, as if we really needed that. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> You know, there are things that oftentimes just don't get a whole lot of attention, but uh, obviously this, this, one, this one did. And uh, both chambers, uh, by a two-thirds vote, have to uh, pass a constitutional amendment, and then it goes directly to the voters. The governor, interestingly enough, has no role in this, in this process at all. The governor can't veto or sign. Uh, all they can do is, is speak up. Uh, if he or she wants to. Um, and so uh, then it just has to, to pass uh, on the ballot by a simple uh, majority vote. Um, now, the, what's interesting is, is that uh, these uh, constitutional amendments are supposed to be on a general election ballot. However, the legislature does have the power uh, to, to alter that and, and did so in, in this circumstance, uh, putting it on the August ballot. And I think the, uh, the proponents of that thought that um, uh, it stood a, a better chance of passing there because you, you traditionally have primary, uh, you, have, you have more Republicans that show up in primaries because there are Republican primaries and oftentimes there aren't as many Democratic primaries and Democrats are not uh, always uh, the, the strongest of, of, of primary voters. Um, but uh, you know, I know we'll talk about this some more, but uh, obviously uh, it, it turned out differently than I think the, the people who uh, uh, were the proponents of that thought that it would. So can I come back to, to you? Uh, can, Cannon's our, our, t our tennis judge for some of the Kansas <laughs> politics. But, the, but the, Ryan, to come back to you, uh, you know, placing the question on the August 2 ballot was contentious. So, you know, uh, why do you think that was a good idea? Was it the right thing to do? Your, your thoughts on that? Well, I think <clears throat> the whole constitutional amendment process, I mean, you have to realize that that process probably started two years uh, before Dobbs came out. Yeah. And so people were making decisions on what uh, a ton of unknowns, what was going to happen in the future. And there was some question about Dobbs because we knew uh, that the Supreme Court was going to rule and it was going to be within, you know, <coughs> a, that, weeks yeah. of, of the vote uh, if it was in August. And so uh, there is some uh, question of if it was on the November ballot, would that give more time for the discussion to be flushed out, um, to have more information about what the constitutional amendment did, whereas you had a very compact timeline. It was only six weeks from when Dobbs came out and, and when the constitutional amendment was voted on. And so I think Dobbs had a pivotal role in that constitutional amendment because we talked about Casey and Roe being a backstop. And I think had uh, the constitutional amendment been voted on pre-Dobbs, um, I think the people of Kansas would have said, look, there's only so far that the legislature can go. We know we have Roe and Casey. That's fine. We'll vote on this constitutional amendment. And I think they would have, I think it would have passed overwhelmingly. But if you take away that backstop, 
and you allowed the legislature to really have full control over the issue, I think people thought, uh, this makes us nervous. We don't know what the legislature is going to do. And I don't think there, there was uh, political viability in some kind of absolute ban without any exceptions. But, um, you know, the political uh, campaign process worked, and uh, whether or not people believe that, um, you know, that's, that's uh, history now. But, uh, yeah, the amendment failed. Yeah. And uh, one or two more questions, and we'll come back to Canon. The, the, uh, Paul, do, do you think that this is going to then be a recurring question for the Kansas electorate uh, to whether it's in constitutional amendment form or otherwise, or do you think that we're going to have there'll be some sort of uh, we, we've had the vote and we are settled on this happy or no? I, I think it's definitely going to be a recurring um, question, and um, you know a lot of people are are wondering you know what what is the next uh, move? Uh, we have six Supreme Court justices, um, unprecedented. We have seven Supreme Court justices in Kansas. Six of them are up for retention uh, in uh, November, and uh, there's discussion about whether there will be an attempt, as, as there has been in the past, to, to unseat uh, these sitting Supreme Court justices and thereby allow, if, they're, if Derek Schmidt would to win the election, uh, would be able to, uh, to appoint somewhere between one and six uh, new justices. Um, uh, there will be, you know, this does not prohibit the legislature from um, passing uh, bills that are going to have, um, you know, for further restrictions perhaps, and then those bills could get, uh, if, if passed into law, and, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, a gubernatorial veto um, under the current composition of the legislature um, uh, will be overridden, and so uh, those issues may fall back into the courts again. And um, you know, as Ryan talked about, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court's ruling um, really uh, said that uh, uh, you know restrictions uh, of, of of most kinds or any kind um, are not going to be looked favorably upon by the court, and so that could be tested again. And then the option, of course, is there to uh, to simply put put this issue on on the ballot again, um, you know. And and I think it will be interesting to see. I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that um, uh, the, the the vote and the size of the vote was fueled um, by Roe being overturned. Um, uh, does if Roe wasn't overturned? Um, how does that change the vote? I, I don't know for certain, but um, in a different environment down the road, um, will that change? Uh, you know, it, it remains to be seen, um, but I don't think that we're going to see uh, a situation where everybody is going to say, well, the people of Kansas have spoken and um, we're just going to go focus on other things. Um, you know, the, uh, the the people who uh, feel strongly about this issue, proponents of this issue, um, there is no more important issue out there. And so um, uh, they're, they're not going to give up. There's no doubt about it. So one, one last political question on this topic in, in Kansas. So, Ryan, do you think there's appetite for another constitutional amendment or test legislation that would go through the Kansas courts, or do you think there will be a, a, a different different strategies? Well, I think one of the big things right now is we do have abortion laws on the books that are currently enacted. I think they're vulnerable to a strict scrutiny challenge. Um, but I think that will be a major focus is making sure. And, and look, a lot of these laws passed with bipartisan support. Uh, they aren't you know, all that controversial. Uh, clinic licensure shouldn't be all that controversial, really. I mean, uh, telling clinics that they can't have carpet in surgical rooms. And we saw that happen in Wyandotte County uh, in the early 2000s, in, in that case, uh, up there. And so uh, making sure that clinics sterilize instruments. I mean, this shouldn't be controversial, and yet um, that was struck down uh, by, by the court under, under this rigorous standard. And so I think a major focus will be protecting the laws that are currently uh, in place uh, because they're relatively popular. Um, I, I don't think the vote uh, in, in August meant that uh, Kansas wants unrestricted abortion. I mean, the truth is people want reasonable restrictions. Uh, they don't want 
uh, absolute bans necessarily. Like I said, I don't think uh, that an absolute ban without any exceptions right now would be political, politically viable in the Kansas legislature. Um, and I don't think it would probably be viable in the future politically. Um, but I think that'll be a major focus. I think the Kansas City Star had an article uh, this morning talking about what uh, Paul was talking about. You know, will there be this challenge to uh, not retain uh, mm -hmm. these six Supreme Court justices? But as Paul also mentioned, this was attempted in 2006. And I think the only thing more difficult than a non-retention election is a write-in election, where <laughs> you actually have to get people to write your name on the ballot. Retention, uh, non-retention type campaigns are very, very difficult to uh, be successful at. You're basically trying to convince people to fire people from positions that they already occupy, and it's a very hard sell. In 2016, I think a major motivator for that non-retention campaign was the, the Carr Brothers decision, which is uh, actually going back in front of the Supreme Court, I think, again, next term, we were talking about yeah. uh, earlier today. Um, and so that, that was a major impetus. There was a lot of energy uh, surrounding that, and it was unsuccessful back in 2016. And so um, I, I don't know that that will be a, an option just because those, those elections are uh, so difficult to win. Yeah. So uh, as we're playing a Nostradamus canon to put on your, uh, your constitutional uh, see the future hat, uh, uh, Ju Justice Thomas suggested that this substantive due process project, which includes not just abortion uh, uh, rights, but, but other rights, uh, that, that that whole uh, body of law is a house of cards and ought to go. Um, do you, there's some people who are excited that that might be the case. There are some people who are terrified that that might be the case. Do you think that that has legs, knowing that you know we're not going to hold you to it? Um, <laughs> it's a long way from one vote to five. I don't think that there is any realistic likelihood that the court, as currently constituted, is going to go further, because I think the court has ar already illustrated it doesn't have the appetite to do that. I think the more interesting question is, will abortion itself come back to the Supreme Court? And there are, I think, a number of unanswered questions. And you know, it's really interesting to hear this discussion about Kansas. I, I sort of reflect on this and think that Kansas has been, you know, very much at the epicenter on the issue of abortion. You know, you sort of think back, you know, all the way back to Senator Dole himself, who probably would not have had the career that he did, but for uh, the uh, intervention of the issue of abortion in one of his first campaigns and perhaps the most famous flyers mm -hmm. in Kansas yeah. political history. And then you think about Operation Rescue and Dr. Tiller in, in Wichita in the 1990s. You know, for a state like Kansas whose politics are complex on this issue, uh, you know, you're gonna see a lot of these issues continuing to be discussed and litigated now on the state level. There'll be very interesting questions, I think, about the interplay between state law and federal law, uh, the extent to which, for instance, states can regulate medication abortions, such as the use of the morning after pill, or whether the FDA's approval of those medications somehow displaces state laws. Um, there's litigation going on concerning um, a, a law in Idaho that does not contain an emergency exception for the health of the mother and whether or not that's permitted under federal law. And so, you know, I think if the Supreme Court thought it was getting itself out of the business of abortion, it's going to be disappointed because I think that these issues are going to come back on the federal level and undoubtedly are going to continue to be litigated on the state level uh, as well. And I think the place to look to see what's likely to happen is states like Kansas and State, other states that have um, a deep divide on this issue. Well, uh, sticking to uh, uh, the abortion topic to a degree, I want to look at another case that came down from the Supreme Court um, in December last year, uh, the, the whole women's health case versus Jackson. And uh, that case was the Texas Senate Bill 8 case. Um, in the media, it was presented as the bounty uh, 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 procedure uh, empowering uh, non-government actors to um, bring abortion pr uh, service providers to court. I don't know if bounty is the right language, but that, I think it was a language often portrayed in the media around this. Uh, before turning over to Canon, the, the issue I want to talk about that in that case is, is the bounty part of it. So the most important Supreme Court case that none of you, except for my upper division law students, have heard of uh, it's called Ex Parte Young. The Supreme Court itself has said it's, not, it's in the top three. 
and you, you've never heard of that before. Most people uh, uh, haven't. And the ruling from that case in sum is that you as a citizen can sue a state officer and enjoin him or her, stop them from doing unconstitutional conduct, from performing that unconstitutional conduct, even though the state itself has immunity. Uh, and the, the, that's become an important part of our rights protection uh, um, framework in the United States. And what was happening with the Senate Bill 8 was an attempt to, in some sense, navigate around that. So maybe, Kennedy, could you explain for us? Yeah, and I'll be yeah. relatively brief on this, yeah. because I know we have a number of other subjects to cover. And in many ways, uh, the, the guts of this case got superseded by Dobbs. But uh, as uh, uh, Professor Mulligan says, um, you know, ordinarily, uh, if you think that a law is invalid, one remedy you have is to sue a state official uh, under Ex parte Young and say this law is unconstitutional, and then you can litigate the question of whether or not the law is constitutional. Texas um, adopted, you know, essentially an outright ban on abortion, but the novelty in the law was that Texas essentially took the power to enforce its state's law and took it from state officials and gave it to private individuals and created you know, essentially a financial reward to individuals who successfully uh, brought actions against anyone who violated the law. And I think the purpose of this, and I don't think there was really any serious doubt about this, was to essentially um, uh, uh, eliminate the ability to bring a pre-enforcement challenge to the constitutionality of the law. And what the Supreme Court ultimately did when the um, question of whether the state could do this came before it, in this case, Whole Women's Health, was to say, well, there appear to be some state officials who still have the ability to enforce the law, and we're going to say that by virtue of the fact that these individuals can uh, uh, enforce the law, that they can potentially be sued, and, and therefore uh, the law can go into effect, and the court refused to uh, stay the operation of the law. The irony is that what ultimately took place as the case went on was that the Texas Supreme Court in further proceedings essentially said, look, these people in fact don't have any ability to enforce the law. And so I think the lasting legacy of this case is not so much in the area of abortion because now Dobbs has uh, eliminated any constitutional right and so in some sense the validity of the underlying law is not open to question. But instead the question of whether or not this is a way that states can structure their laws to uh, avoid uh, uh, these sorts of constitutional challenges. And that could potentially cut in both directions. You could have a state that wants to limit the ability to carry firearms to essentially create a similar quote unquote bounty uh, system and there would be questions about how far a state could go um, to do that. So I think that that's really the interesting question in the wake of this decision. I agree and w one follow up there, and don't we find the chief once again kind of on an island uh, in that case where the, the, if we will indulge in the right versus left view of the court, uh, being a bit more welcoming of this bounty's uh, structuring of state statutes and the chief being a bit more reticent. Yeah, I think that's yeah. exactly right because the chief justice joined by the three more liberal uh, members of the court, the three democratic appointees, you know, really dissented and essentially said the ability potentially to sue these few state officers was um, insufficient, that this uh, whole structure was more generally problematic. Yeah. So um, if, if we think about this idea of having bounties, that's not an entirely new thing, nor uh, tied politically one way or the other. M many of our environmental laws, you might call them bounties. Um, they have these things called qui tam actions, but th they're the same thing, just with a fancy Latin name. Um, and so we, we see this in, in the law. Do you, do you think uh, you'll see um, Kansas perhaps trying to use these sort of bounty structures to try to avoid judicial review on, it? pick your favorite issue? Um, I, I don't know if there'll be uh, the stomach for it, especially after the litigatory history, and then what, what the Kansas Supreme Court would end up doing with uh, laws like that. Yeah. I don't know uh, if they would look at uh, those very favorably um, as well. But I do think um, some of these other states, uh, you know, we just had this vote in August, but you had all these trigger laws go into effect, 
in uh, legislatures like in Missouri um, could pass these things when Roe and Casey were in place and you know, there were some that believed, oh, they'll never go away, so what does it matter? We'll put this trigger law in effect. And so what that law would do is if Roe and Casey were overturned, it would put a ban, and, and that's essentially what has yeah. happened in a number, a number of states. And I think that had a huge impact on, on the uh, vote in August as well yeah. because people saw some of these other states doing things like that. Um, and, you know, I think that, that was one of the reasons why you had the, the vote come out the way it did. Uh, Paul, still thinking about the, the bounties. We know California is moving towards, uh, a, a bount, as Cannon uh, suggested, a bounty system to essentially try to squirt, to skirt uh, um, judicial review on Second Amendment issues. Um, do, do you think that those types of things will become more politically popular, perhaps here in Kansas, that those types of things, maybe not on guns here in Kansas, but yeah. from the Democratic political perspective? You know, I agree with Ryan that I think it's uh, unlikely that you're going to see those issues uh, uh, get a whole lot of salience in, in Kansas, but I think in some of these deep blue and deep red states, uh, y you may see more of this. And, you know, from my perspective, you just kind of have to look at this from a, um, you know, is this good public policy? And, and thinking about, you know, the democratic process that we have, the separation of powers, um, you know, that is, you know, served in my mind, served our country pretty darn well for uh, decades upon decades upon decades, and you know, I, I, I would hope that no matter what your political perspective, um, you know, we 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 want the courts to do their jobs, and um, when when legislatures pass laws that are unconstitutional, the courts uh, should, they have a proper role um, there. And, you know, and there's, there's just more and more that's sort of going on, I think, you know, from the right and the left in this country about if we can't get our way, let's go change the rules, let's change the process. Um, you know, to my, my Democrat friends who talked about how we need to um, expand the Supreme Court. Um, I, I disagree with them on that. I mean, we have uh, nine justices, and you know what? Elections have consequences. And if you didn't win, guess what? The, the president that wins, uh, that, that you may not share their perspective, gets the right to appoint um, those individuals. And, um, you know, and I, th I think that we need to hopefully have more dialogue in our country about, you know, really preserving the traditions uh, that have and the processes of and the separation of powers that has served the country uh, very well because, um, you know, there, there are forces that are coming from, from both sides of the political spectrum that are trying to change that. So, so Cannon, sort of jumping on, on Paul's question, do you see not only as a, 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 an incredible advocate, but someone who I know um, deeply believes in the, the role that the judiciary plays. Um, do you see these movements of California from the left and Texas on the right to try to avoid judicial review? Do you see that as concerning for the role that the courts play? Is that a legitimacy concern that you see, or is this a blip? I mean, it, it is concerning if the effect is to render it impossible to adjudicate the underlying constitutionality of the laws. And you know, one of the arguments that was made in the Texas case was that as a practical matter, um, the penalties were so potentially draconian that rather than um, uh, 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 running the risk uh, that someone would incur those penalties, that parties would just be chilled in their behavior, and therefore you would never be able to resolve the constitutionality of the law. And it always seemed to me that that was the strongest argument uh, that uh, the challengers had to a law like SB 8. And I think that that principle is not one that lacks traction in the court system. The courts are obviously concerned about being deprived of their role as the final arbiter on questions of constitutional law. So I think if we see these laws become more pervasive, I suspect we might see the courts, and the Supreme Court in particular, become more skeptical about them, precisely because it would displace the court from its ultimate 
role, as John Marshall, the great Chief Justice, said, to say what the law is. Well, so moving from uh, abortion to the entire role of the judiciary to the sleepy topic of guns, um, <laughs> the uh, Supreme Court in uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol uh, versus uh, Brown uh, was looking at the issue of the ability of citizens, in this case New York, to uh, carry handguns not on their personal property but in uh, public, public spaces and whether that required licensure or not. Um, and in New York, we had a relatively, I would think fair to say, one of the more rigorous licensing regimes in the country. So, Candy, could you give us the, the Yeah, sure, case and, and this is a, a pretty straightforward case to understand. So in a case called District of Columbia versus Heller in the late 2000s, the Supreme Court um, first recognized the principle that the Second Amendment to the Constitution guarantees an individual right uh, to bear arms. And there had been much debate about whether that was the correct interpretation. It was resolved by the Supreme Court in an opinion written by my former boss, Justice Scalia. Since that opinion, um, there's been a lot of question about what that means for various types of regulations of guns, both on the federal and the state level. And the issue came back to the Supreme Court in the Bruin case this term, which, uh, as Lou says, was a case involving New York's regime for obtaining licenses to carry firearms outside the home. And I think it's fair to say that New York had essentially the strictest regime in the country because New York didn't just require background checks, as many states do, but it went further and it required an applicant to show essentially individualized cause to um, uh, be able to carry a firearm. And typically that required a showing of some individualized threat to the individual, the individual needing a firearm because they were in a dangerous job, and so forth. And only a very small number of states had that requirement. I think it was seven states in all. And the Supreme Court ultimately held that that restriction went too far, too far and it violated the Second Amendment right. Now, I think many of us thought that the Supreme Court would say that that was true under a doctrine known as strict scrutiny, which is the doctrine that Lou referred to earlier and that the Supreme Court would say that the Second Amendment right's a fundamental right, and therefore the government has to have a compelling interest in order to limit that right. But instead, the court did something quite different, and in an opinion written by Justice Thomas, a six to three majority of the court said, the way we're going to analyze this is to look at whether the restriction in question is rooted in historical practice. And so what we're going to do is really go back to the time of um, the, the framing or, or perhaps a, a slightly later time for reasons that we don't need to get into here and look at whether or not this sort of restriction was accepted. And that was a really um, significant um, methodological step in terms of how to go about constitutional analysis. The court suggested in its opinion that that methodology might apply not only to Second Amendment questions, but also questions involving other constitutional rights, such as the right to free speech under the First Amendment. And I think there are some very interesting questions about how that methodology is going to work going forward. How do you determine what the correct historical analog is, for instance, for a ban on Sem, uh, on automatic or semi-automatic rifles when no such weapons existed in 1789? What about a ban on carrying firearms on the subway? There certainly weren't any subways in 1789 either. And so I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the law develops from here. And in particular in the Second Amendment area, I think there is you know, continued uncertainty about the validity of various types of regulations. And it's very interesting, particularly for the federal government, even when you have more conservative administrations in place, on the one hand, um, uh, uh, conservatives uh, tend to be more protective of the right uh, to bear firearms. On the other hand, there are all of these federal laws that prohibit felons from carrying firearms, that criminalize committing various offenses with firearms, and I think there are going to be lingering questions about whether or not some of those restrictions are in fact consistent with the Second Amendment right. So Ryan, if we can turn to you then, g going from the, you know, the pristine palace Greek, Greek temple that we have in the U.S. <laughs> Supreme Court to uh, Kansas politics, uh, gun ownership and, and uh, vigorously protecting gun ownership is a powerful animating force for a lot of Kansas politics. Could you give a little bit of, of how that's worked, and you know, but you know, basically, where do we, we're not a New York state in terms of 
<laughs> That's what a regulation. Well, yeah, in Kansas, we have constitutional carry that they just passed a, a few years ago, um, which means basically you don't have to have a license. A lot of people get concealed carry permits because they want reciprocity with other states. Um, and uh, I think there's a, a, a donut hole where if you want to carry from 18 to 21, you have to have a concealed carry license, uh, but then 21 and over, uh, you can carry constitutionally as a constitutional right. Um, but you, you mentioned what are the animating forces, how is this an animating force? And it's interesting, Cannon said, um, you know, that this is, the conservative uh, approach has a more protective view, but I, I read actually CNN had an article um, that just came out yesterday that said new gun owners are actually women, um, minorities, and more liberal. And so they're seeing this trend that uh, in some urban areas, I mean, what the gun is, and you talk about historically, is you know, we're a country of pioneers. You know, usually you didn't have police officers that would come and protect you. You're out on the prairie on your homestead and then you had your gun, you know, and I think. Uh, a lot of Americans kind of embrace that ideal because it's an equalizer. You know, if a person of lower physical uh, stature uh, it comes up on a person with greater physical strength, um, a gun will change the game. And so um, I think that is why you're seeing even people on the more liberal side of things, if they feel unsafe, um, if their cities just don't feel like they have the law and order um, to have the police available to come to their aid, then they, they are looking to go buy a gun for their own self-protection. And so I think um, you know, that has been fundamental in Kansas. We have a lot of hunting, uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, and so a lot of people grow up with guns in Kansas, and um, they like their, their guns here in Kansas, and uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. And, and this is also another example where we have the federal constitution, the state constitution doing different things. Right, being more explicitly protective of this constitutional carry provision because they're separate bodies of law emanating from separate times and doing d different things in the, in the same way that we saw out of the HODA's decision. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, Paul, uh, maybe not all of our, our, our citizens uh, agree with, with, with Ryan's view, and we you know we've had issues with um, so-called ghost guns and, and other things. Do you, do you see any political uh, will in Kansas for I any sort of uh, regulation in that space, or do you, do you think that's, that, that doesn't have legs here in Kansas? Yeah, pr probably not. Yeah. Uh, y you know, former um, U.S. Senator Alan Simpson from Wyoming, who I knew was a, a I think a close friend of Bob Dole's and, and colleague, um, had a great line about uh, in Wyoming, uh, gun control, uh, when you talk about gun control, people talk about how to best steady your rifle. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the same can be said in, in Kansas. Um, you know, periodically there are, are bills introduced that, that fall into the sort of gun control or trying to restrict firearms category. Uh, they rarely ever uh, go much of anywhere in the, in the legislature. When I started uh, in 2003, uh, the big debate was about whether we were going to pass a concealed carry bill and which uh, the state ultimately did, went through a very, uh, I think, thoughtful discussion about uh, what are the proper exceptions and restrictions that should be uh, put into that. The National Rifle Association uh, there at the table. Um, and as things have evolved in, in the debate, um, you know, the, those exceptions uh, have been removed from law uh, kind of one by one. And, uh, um, you know, it, it is, uh, it's, a, it's an issue that I think uh, you see the, uh, the pronounced differences between uh, rural and urban areas um, uh, probably more than any other uh, issue out there. And, um, you know, when you look at the case in New York um, and, you know, how there are many communities, um, you know, there are no issues with gun, gun ownership. Uh, you go to the south side of Chicago and it is a whole different ball game. And, um, you know, how can those communities who have um, major problems with um, gun trafficking and, and gun violence, uh, try to address those issues on, on a local basis, um, uh, they're, they're, you know, it's gonna be a real challenge for them um, to do that. And 
but I don't, you know, I don't see anything changing in Kansas. Yeah, yeah Luke, can I add just one please, thing to this? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll just add an observation on this, and this is not meant to be a criticism of the Supreme Court, but, you know, what Ryan said and, and, and what Paul said are, are, are things that I actually really was thinking about as I was listening to the oral argument in the Bruin case, because, you know, we have a Supreme Court nowadays that's essentially a bi-coastal Supreme Court, even those members of the court who, you know, uh, uh, come from the middle of the country in some respects, like Justice Gorsuch, you know, grew up in Washington, went to a Washington high school. And so when you hear the Supreme Court have an oral argument in a case like this, I mean, they were obsessed with the subway. You know, they spent a lot of time talking about, well, what does this mean for subways? And I think they come at it from the urban perspective, and I think that the urban perspective on firearms is very different from the perspective of someone from a state like Kansas. You know, many of us grew up, uh, as I did, in a, in, in a hunting family and grew up around firearms uh, and, and in a very different way from those who live on, say, the south side of Chicago. And so, you know, I think in many ways, I, I think that, that really does inform the way that people think about these issues, and I do think that we have a, a, a Supreme Court that very much thinks about it with the urban mindset. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, so, so, Council, uh, the, the red light is almost on, but I, w I would like us to talk about the redistricting cases a little bit. So, without maybe talking about one case, but is there a general thrust that you're seeing from the, the Supreme Court with the different redistricting cases that we saw last year? Yeah, it's such an interesting and complicated area of the law, and so I'll try to not even get into yeah. too much detail <laughs> and just sort of state some general principles. I think that the Supreme Court has been taking a progressively narrower view of the Federal Voting Rights Act, um, which has been construed, you know, quite, which had previously been construed quite expansively to um, essentially um, permit uh, the creation of, for instance, um, majority minority or minority focused voting districts. And uh, you have a Supreme Court now that is really moving towards a more race neutral approach and therefore has, uh, you know, essentially suspended the operation of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and may be poised to limit the scope of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, you have a Supreme Court that has refused to get into the pervasive question of political gerrymandering and that um, has taken the view that uh, it does not violate the Constitution for a state to take political considerations into account when drawing district lines. And all of us know that every state uh, uh, does that in some way, shape, or form. Virtually every state nowadays does that in some way, shape, or form. And then you have um, an issue that is coming before the Supreme Court this year, which is the role of state courts in adjudicating uh, uh, gerrymandering and reviewing um, state laws governing federal elections more generally. There's a very interesting constitutional case called Moore versus Harper, uh, which uh, is going to present that issue. It's a case that, I said I wasn't gonna talk about cases, I'll talk about <laughs> one for about two sentences. It's a case that involves um, North Carolina's congressional map, which was invalidated by the North Carolina Supreme Court on the ground that it violated the state constitution yeah. by uh, engaging in impermissible political gerrymandering. And the question before the Supreme Court is essentially whether the constitution, the federal constitution, permits a state court to intervene in that fashion. So there's a lot going on. It, it, it's the most complicated area of the law imaginable. When I was in the Federal Solicitor General's Office, which is the component of the Justice Department that handles the federal government's um, Supreme Court litigation, uh, I had the voting rights docket, and reading those cases almost made me want to lose my will to live because the cases were so <laughs> complicated. It's a very intricate area of the law. Um, but I do think that the court um, seems to be poised to um, perhaps modify the way in which the law operates. And again, seems to be moving towards a view uh, of race neutrality and sort of taking a somewhat more hands-off view uh, when it comes to judicial intervention in this area. Yeah. So, so Ryan, you know, as we sit here in the first uh, congressional district here in Lawrence, mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> for those of you who aren't in on the joke, that, that runs from here to, to uh, Goodland on the Colorado border. Um, uh, 
what's gone on in Kansas? <laughs> <laughs> what has gone on in Kansas? Well, um, I was actually general counsel for the Secretary of State's office uh, in 2012, and Paul, you were in the legislature at that yeah. time, and I thought that redistricting cycle was contentious um, <laughs> because it went to court uh, back then if, uh, in a case, uh, Essex versus Kobach. Um, and uh, the legislature just couldn't come up with the maps at, at that point in time. And Paul, my wife says you were great to work with, by the way. Uh, As on, was on, she. <laughs> on redistricting. Uh, she was in the speaker's office at the time. Um, but, you know, that case went to court because of legislative inaction. And this year we had uh, a situation where the legislature passed actually the state maps in a fairly bipartisan manner. It was the congressional maps that were contentious, as you yeah. referenced. Um, the, the congressional districts changed it uh, substantially. And um, uh, some groups uh, filed suit, um, actually one here in Douglas County and one in Wyandotte County. And those cases got uh, consolidated uh, in Wyandotte County. Uh, Judge Clapper ended up uh, uh, ha holding the trial on that case, the the Rivera um, case, and I I didn't see Stephen McAllister. He got pulled into that. Yeah, I think he, he represented, uh, represented Douglas County, Douglas County uh -huh. plaintiffs. We got pulled into that uh, on behalf of some witnesses that were subpoenaed, and so it was a, a packed courtroom full of lawyers. As was the 2012. I think we had 18 interveners in in 2012, mm -hmm. um, and and so it was it was packed, but. Um, the Kansas Supreme Court initially declined to take cert on that, and that uh, confused a lot of people because of the, um, you know, the question of uh, political justiciability. Um, you know, similar to Hodes, um, in, in the redistricting context, uh, you had groups go um, and are still continuing to do this, go to states uh, to try and get state Supreme Courts to find a prohibition in the state constitution that disallows political gerrymandering because uh, the United States Supreme Court has pretty much said um, that's a political question and it's non-justiciable because that's what the political process is, um, is for. And they said, uh, once you wander into the political thicket, you'll never get out. Um, and so, uh, a lot of these cases are being brought strategically, and I think that was the case here in Kansas, uh, because the plaintiffs did ask the court to find uh, that the Kansas Constitution uh, prohibited political gerrymandering, uh, as well as bringing claims on uh, equal protection grounds for racial uh, gerrymandering. And the Kansas Supreme Court, after a full trial, uh, took it up again and said, essentially, in Kansas, political gerrymandering is allowed. Uh, and then they also said uh, the equal protection uh, racial-based gerrymandering is prohibited, but that the record didn't contain sufficient evidence to find it. And so um, the, the congressional districts are as, as they are right now, as they were drawn by the legislature. But another interesting uh, thing in Can Kansas um, is, you know, the, this idea of whether or not the elections clause of the Constitution uh, prohibits uh, a state court uh, the, or of the, of the U.S. Constitution uh, of the U.S. Constitution. I'm sorry, um, prohibits a court from drawing a map here in Kansas. Uh, in our Constitution, uh, Article 10, by law, by Constitution, the the state legislative maps automatically go to the state Supreme Court and the attorney general within a certain amount of time has to petition the state Supreme Court to certify the validity of those maps. But if the Kansas Supreme Court finds them invalid, it goes back to the legislature and they have to come up with a new map in 15 days and then it goes back to the Supreme Court and then the Constitution provision anticipates that it might go back to the legislature and so it has two clauses uh, that says it goes back to the le legislature for 15 days and just yeah, around yeah. and around you go. Um, but you know, that is unique because in Kansas, the state maps automatically are going to have some kind of judicial review. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, in, in this redistricting cycle, we had, um, we had the Rivera case, but I think it has kind of settled the question of whether or yeah. not political gerrymandering is allowed in Kansas. So Paul, hypothetically, as someone who's run in a congressional district in Kansas, you know, uh, um, does allowing, explicitly allowing that political gerrymandering in Kansas, does that uh, impact the ability uh, for, you know, different parties, whether it's a libertarian party or a, a democratic party or a, another third party to, to succeed in Kansas in a meaningful way in your view? Well, you know, the political gerrymandering is, is going on um, in both parties. And it's yeah. you, 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 you go to a blue state like Illinois or Maryland, and it's, it's going on just as it is in, you know, North Carolina or 
Ohio, and uh, it's, you know, whoever is in power is going to utilize that power to, to stay in power. And, um, you know, the, the end result is, I think, you know, everybody is frustrated with a, a Congress, uh, you know, m mainly a House of Representatives that, uh, you know, can't seem to do much of anything in a bipartisan way, doesn't seem to get along with anybody. Uh, and it's because, uh, you know, over time, and it's going to be worse after this election, you, you have more districts that are, the, the, the red got re is redder and the blue is bluer. And so um, you're going to have fewer and fewer lawmakers who are incentivized uh, to try to reach across the aisle and to, to compromise. Um, the good thing about the U.S. Senate is, is you can't gerrymander a state. Um, and so, um, you know, there's been a longstanding tradition that Bob Dole was very much a part of, of, of uh, uh, people being able to work across the aisle in, in the Senate, and they're, they're still able to, it's not as what it, what it used to be. But, you know, I think the, um, you know, in Kansas, we, we, have, we have had a tradition, and I think it, um, you know, kind of goes back to the, the level of civility uh, at, at the legislative level that exists there um, of trying to work uh, with each other. And, and I should mention also that, that uh, redistricting is not just a partisan issue. There's a lot of different attributes to it. And it's, um, you know, everybody uh, wants this little piece of territory and not that piece of territory. I'll never forget the meeting that I was in with the Wyandotte County delegation that was trying, you know, in a, in a room all yelling at each other because, you know, this person wanted this neighborhood and that person wanted that neighborhood and, and it, was, it was something else. But so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's personal politics uh, at, its, at its finest and at its worst. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish that there was a magic bullet that, that, that could solve this. Um, I do think that the, um, the Supreme Court's decision, um, you know, ha has opened the door here for, um, you know, what could be more partisan uh, gerrymandering um, that's going to occur in the, in the future. Um, you know, I think there were a lot of uh, legislators and some, some I talked to in the, in the Republican Party that didn't necessarily like having to do what, was, what happened with the congressional map, um, but there were forces uh, outside that, that wanted it that way. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, and I feel bad for the members of Congress who are, <laughs> are in these positions and have absolutely no say whatsoever. Uh, it's, it's all up to a group of state legislators of what their districts are gonna look like. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say that uh, things are gonna change or are gonna get better, um, but I, I don't think they are until really um, the people um, are gonna say sort of enough is enough, and and you know, and there's there's different kinds of, of of ballot measures out there that have been adopted in in nonpartisan commissions, and you know, there there's good things about some of those, and there's bad things about some of those, um, and so uh, it's it's a it's a tough tough issue, and the problem with with a you know, and a, a political environment that is just getting more and more toxic out there, um, it, it just lends itself uh, to. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, bad things. Mm -hmm. Well, before we uh, go to questions, uh, I just want to make a couple of observations and, and a couple of thanks to you. First, I see that Mark Johnson is here, who's someone who, who's uh, been a long-time supporter of this program. I'd like to thank him uh, for that. I'd like to thank the, the Dole Institute and everyone who works in the Dole Institute for everything they do, not just for this program, but for all the incredible programs they have. And then lastly, I would just like to note uh, in an era where people get on uh, national television only to scream at each other and tell the other person how horrible they are, um, that you can have folks who passionately disagree about things, who can share a great meal, uh, who, who can tease each other about their high school sports team, who can talk civilly with each other uh, um, about really hard issues. And I think that's what the Senator Dole's legacy and this institute is about and trying to model that uh, for all of us. And if we can do nothing else, if we can engage in that a little bit more without changing our view, but respecting other people, um, that will uh, uh, help us uh, as a society. So with my Polonius moment over. <laughs>
uh, we do welcome uh, questions from online or from the audience. So question, if you're online, questions go to dolequestions at ku.edu, and you can email those in. If we don't have questions, I am tempted to call on my students. Yeah? Josh and I have an attorney at Spookout. They're gonna, I think you need the microphone oh, so sorry. they can hear you online. Sorry. Josh and I am an attorney in Topeka. Um, I'd like to know, Ken, if you could uh, maybe uh, opine on whether the concept of the preserving the legitimacy of the of our institutions and specifically the judicial branch, whether you think that whether the SCOTUS justices or other justices factoring in legitimacy in the political process into their decisions is occurring, are we getting different uh, decisions as a result of the political discord, and whether that in and of, if, it's, it, if it is occurring, whether that only adds fuel to the fire, so to speak, uh, in terms of the um, external factors that may, may be coming into some of these uh, decisions instead of just purely interpreting the law? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd say two things in response to that, Josh. I would say first that we are in a period when, because the court has decided some exceptionally uh, consequential issues, there have been, you know, criticism of the legit, there has been criticism of the legitimacy of those decisions. And I think that that is just reflective of the toxic political environment in which we live, in which it is not enough simply to disagree with your opponent. You have to call their legitimacy into question. I think that that is an unfortunate um, trend, and I think it is potentially damaging for the institution and damaging for the institution over the long term uh, if uh, people think of the Supreme Court as just another political actor and if they uh, uh, sort of question, uh, again, the, the validity, not, not just the, the validity of the outcome of the court's decisions, but they question the validity of the entire uh, enterprise. You know, that having been said, uh, I think that there are political checks on the Supreme Court. Ultimately, the biggest political check is the fact that the members of the Supreme Court are nominated through the political process and over the long term, the party that controls the political branches will control who gets nominated to the Supreme Court, and over time, that changes, and it undoubtedly will change in the future. You raise the specific question, the other issue, of um, whether this affects the way that the court acts. And I've long taken the view that the court inevitably takes the practical consequences of its decisions into account, because the Supreme Court is, after all, making the law for the entire country, and particularly when the court is considering whether or not to revisit its past decisions, the practical uh, expectations, the reliance interests, and so forth are part of the equation. I think where that gets a little bit dangerous, though, is if the court is not just taking the practical consequences into account, but looking in the proverbial mirror and saying, how is this gonna make me look? You know, are people going to like this decision? We rely on the Supreme Court not to be a political actor, not to be driven by the polls, to do the unpopular thing. You know, there's no better example than uh, a case from just down the road, Brown versus Board of Education. The Supreme Court did the right thing in that case, even though it knew that that was going to be uh, unpopular. And we rely on the Supreme Court to protect the unpopular, to guarantee certain basic rights, to ensure that the political branches are held in check. And all of those things, at some level, are um, uh, sort of counter-majoritarian. They are not necessarily what 51% of the American people at any given time are going to want um, to do. And so I think there's a distinction there between on the one hand, thinking about what the effects of a legal rule are going to be and being concerned about how the court is going to be perceived. The former seems to me to be more appropriate than the latter. If I could extend that question to uh, Ryan and Paul, to Kansas, where our justices do have this retention election, may, maybe not especially effectual, but do you think that has a different play, or should it have a different play because of that election component that we have in our system, different from the federal system where we don't have that? 
What is it? In Kansas, for the Kansas Supreme Court, we have a nomination commission model. Uh, uh, so there, there are politics in it. I mean, I, I know people call it merit selection, but uh, the nominating commission is um, comprised of nine members, uh, f uh, four of which are appointed by the governor each year of the governor's term. Uh, five of those members are elected by the lawyers um, in, in the state. So one from each congressional district and then one lawyer at large, and that makes up the, the nine member commission. Um, many people, I think Stephen Ware here at KU as a law professor, has been very critical of the anti-democratic nature of that, um, of that model because the people on the stage, we're lawyers and we get a vote for a congressional member, we get a vote for the at large, and we get a vote for governor. If you aren't a lawyer here, you get a vote for governor, that's it. And that's an entire branch of your government uh, that you really don't have a say uh, in, in who they are. Um, and so I think there are conversations occurring in Kansas about, um, you know, what, what does this, how does this system work? Um, is it more important to have a more democratic uh, type of, uh, of judicial selection process? But then you look at the federal system in, in some of these uh, hearings in, in the Senate. I mean, the Kavanaugh uh, nomination uh, hearing was famous, I mean, it, for its contentiousness. And I don't think people in Kansas want that either. But then again, we, we did change the, um, the judicial nominating uh, process for Court of Appeals. And that is more similar to the federal model uh, where you have um, the governor appoint and then they're confirmed by the Senate. And those, those Senate confirmation hearings have been fairly rigorous. Um, there have been some justices that were not confirmed um, or some judges that were not confirmed here in Kansas. Um, but they haven't been ugly in the way that some people would have perceived uh, the, the Kavanaugh hearing. So, um, yeah, I think there are discussions about that, but uh, not surrounding the legitimacy of the institution, but more how, how that the members of the institution are selected. Well, jumping from the front end of it to the back end, Paul, on the retention election side, do you think that possibility of re-election, this will have to be our last comment, that possibility of re-election impacts decision making in Kansas, should it? I mean, we, the, the election's supposed to mean something, so sh should it you know, have an impact? Well, I, I, I do think uh, there, there's a lot of speculation out there that um, uh, that that has played a factor. Um, and, uh, you know, I was involved in a case um, a number of years ago where there were the um, non-economic damage caps that were being knocked down by state courts all across the country and then our court went the other way right before a retention election and then when the composition of the court changed it uh, went the other way um, later on and um, you know I think that had the Supreme Court uh, of knocked down um, the congressional map this time um, they would there would be a, 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 a real effort to try to oust um, you know, between one and six of those uh, justices. And, you know, Ryan and I were involved in this redistricting case that went to federal court 10 years ago, and um, you had sort of all of, all of the players in, in state government that were assembled there bef before three federal judges, and those three federal judges could, could absolutely give a hoot who we were. <laughs> and uh, they were gonna just deal with this case, and, and they were gonna move on down the road. Um, when there are cases that are pending in state courts and um, you know, in, in appellate courts, uh, it's different in, in Kansas uh, because uh, the, the, the Chief Justice of, of the Supreme Court has to walk over across the street uh, with his hat in hand and beg for funding um, for, from the legislature. I mean, the legislature has the power of the purse and uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't always get decisions I liked, but uh, judges were always really nice to me when I was in the legislature. <laughs> um, and I, I, I hated the position that they, they would ha have to be in as, as a result of, of that. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I do think, you know, Ryan talked a little bit about the, the, the model that we have for uh, selecting justices and, um, you know, it is not a perfect model by any means, but 
nobody's come up with a better one. And I know there's ideas of people who have who have a better one. In my in my mind, I, I think it's it's worked pretty well because it's not really about in the end of the day, you know, having liberal or conservative judges. Um, I, I want as a practicing lawyer, uh, I want competent judges. Um, I want judges who are smart that understand the law, and um, you know, and that's not a partisan issue at all. And, and the nominating commission largely just weeds out the candidates uh, who are who are not qualified. And, and what you want to do is, is make sure that you're putting three names on the governor's desk of, of people who can all do the job. Um, and uh, you know, we've we've now Ryan alluded to the fact that uh, the, the process for the court of appeals has has changed. And um, you know, uh, the first nominee um, to the Court of Appeals was, uh, was now Justice Stiegel, um, you know, who's known as, as pretty conservative, uh, but also known as, as one of the great legal minds in Kansas, who absolutely uh, should have been on the Kansas Court of Appeals, should be on the S Supreme Court. Um, and the first thing that happened um, was, you know, the Democrats are out there trying to find out everything they can about his past and get partisan and nitpick about things uh, like that. And if you want to see legislators, uh, oftentimes at, at their worst, um, you know, look at some of these confirmation processes that you have, you know, both in Topeka and and in Washington D.C. And so, um, you know, that that concerns me a great deal because we're getting fewer and fewer people who want to serve um, on. The Kansas Court of Appeals because they don't want to have to go through that process. I have a question yeah. from a call-in question yeah. I'd like to get through. I won't give the name, but I'll say it's from a very prominent Kansas attorney, <laughs> and he knows a lot about Constitution law. His question is, does the Dobbs majority's theory of returning the issue of abortion, in quotes, to the people, rest on a flawed premise that state legislatures, in fact, represent the interest of the people in light of the entrenched partisan gerrymandering that now indisputably exist in all, or almost all, state legislatures. Indeed, some Kansas Republican legislators who are running unchallenged have acknowledged that their anti-abortion views are likely contrary to the majority of the constituents in their districts. Isn't the system now essentially dysfunctional and not just on the issue of abortion? I'm well, not, does anybody want to take uh, that? I, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course it's dysfunctional. It's, it's, uh, it's a legislative process, uh, but it, you know, the, the legislature that we have in Kansas is a representative body. I mean, they are elected by the the people of Kansas, and um, you know, uh, and if if you if you don't like what you're getting, um, you know, that's you know that's that's what you're voting for. And uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things about this this vote that we just had in August, um, I, I'm not a big fan of initiative and referendum and letting. Uh, every, everybody out there decide every issue. I mean, I, I tend to believe in, in representative democracy because uh, as, as much as the, the legislature gets a lot of criticism, I do think that the, the legislature uh, vets a, a lot of issues properly and, and does make uh, um, good decisions. And, and I don't necessarily want, you know, whatever interest group is going to spend the most money uh, to sway people to, to be able to do that. But you know, I think by and large, um, uh, when the vote, when voters went to the polls, um, you know, voter, I think Democrats and Republicans can agree that uh, voters are often confused <laughs> and misled. Um, but by and large, I think, uh, you know, they, they kind of knew what they were voting on. And, and I know that there was, you know, there's a lot to, about the language was confusing and, and that's, you know, sure, there were people that were con confused, but, uh, you know, this was kind of a cut and dry issue, and they, and, and they sort of knew what it was about, and, and they knew what they were voting on. Um, not, not everybody, but, um, and, and to me, you know, that was kind of, a, kind of a refreshing thing every once in a while to, to have that.
Ryan or Cannon, do you guys want to jump in on that last question? Or? I mean, I'll just say one thing, which is, you know, there was a really interesting piece by David Leonhardt in the New York Times a few weeks ago that sort of did a deep dive into some of the uh, things that are going on in our political process. And, and as is usually true with articles in the New York Times, I violently disagreed with various aspects of his reasoning. But I think one thing that's hard to dispute is the distortive effect of gerrymandering, both in the House of Representatives on the federal level and in state legislatures, because the effect of political gerrymandering is inevitably, number one, to benefit one party over the other, but number two, at least in the modern era, to create safe seats where the greatest risk to a legislator is being primaried, it's not losing in a general election. And of course, Kansas has its own unique uh, 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 gloss on that because of, of the nature of Kansas politics, but, but many of the dynamics are the same. And I think it's hard to dispute that that is a systematic problem. I think the, the issue is that uh, the federal constitution doesn't by its terms speak to political gerrymandering, and so this is an issue that has to be fixed by the, through the political process, and fixing a broken political process through the political process is not easy. It is one of the reasons why I think the voting rights issues we were discussing are incredibly important because they bear on various aspects of that problem. But in terms of the sort of fundamental problem, which is the rise of political gerrymandering and the greater ease with which that can be done thanks to technology and the like, um, I'm not sure there's an easy fix through the legal system. Ryan, the opportunity for the last word? Yeah, I, I'd just uh, say one thing about the question. I think it conflates all the maps together as one redistricting and gerrymandering mandering occurred in redistricting. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about the issue of abortion, um, the legislative, state legislative districts in Kansas were relatively uncontroversial and passed bipartisan. And those were the districts that are going to decide the, the, the abortion question after Dobbs. And so I think uh, the question has a flawed premise in, you know, confusing the congressional district maps where the controversy was with the actual state legislative maps, maps that are actually going to answer the question. Um, and so I just point out that there are different maps, and some of them weren't controversial, and the congressional map was the only one that really was. Well, with that, this is one incredible panel, and we're really lucky to have them here at the University of Kansas. So help me thank them. Yes. And on behalf of the Dole Institute, thank you all so very much. That was just truly outstanding. And if others had questions and you didn't get the answer, I apologize, but I hope in their lengthy answers that you got your answers and it was very diverse. So one more round of applause of great appreciation. Thank you very much.